reversal options. So this slide is intentionally blank because there are not any pharmacologic agents, uh, especially as we understand that mechanism of action that they're irreversible binders, binding the drug or doing something about the receptor uh, is irrelevant because those are all occupied by drug if the drug has been in the system. So maybe a better way to think about it or what are some corrective measures? So kind of starting with the least evidence to the most, there, are, there is a few case reports about desmopressin. Um, it's based on a CEA uh, carotid enterodrectomy patient and a single dose of 0.3 micrograms per, per kilogram. And how desmopressin would have an effect is increasing von Willebrand brand factor and uh, GP2B3A, so downstream of where the blockage is um, on the platelets from these other medications. Uh, so it can increase sort of platelet aggregation in that mechanism. However, this has only been anecdotally study, studied. Additionally, that dose of desmopressin or DDAVP will exert antidiuretic hormone effects, leading to free water resorption at the kidney, hyponatremia potentially, as well as uh, volume expansion, which are the things we really don't uh, don't want in neurosurgical patients. So something that's not very popular in our case, um, and I think. Uh, does not really have evidence to support it, but wanted to mention it. Additionally, for Novo7, um, it's an off-label use. Uh, it has been shown to decrease expansion of hematoma, but not necessarily improve uh, or clinical outcomes. It also comes at the cost of an increase of thrombotic events, so about 7% thrombotic risk in those patients compared to 2% in patients not dosed with that medication. Uh, so again, that's uh, case reports, um, anecdotal, no hard evidence to support that use. So I think platelet infusions are the thing that probably has the most attention. And uh, if giving patients platelets who are on these medications and show up with bleeding of some variety, if that's helpful. So looking at that evidence, there's a whole slew of small case reports that are about 30 patients or less. A lot of them looked at laboratory outcome data. So if you give a unit of platelets, does the platelet aggregation numbers change? And the encouraging studies were really just based on lab study, lab outcomes that said, yes, sometimes the platelet number can aggregation, platelet aggregometry looks better if you've given a unit of platelets. The studies that looked at patient outcomes, do they clinically do better, or do they have less expansion, did not seem to indicate that there's any benefit to providing platelets. Um, additionally, there's one study that suggests it would take about five, uh, a five pack of platelets or more to reverse the effects of an aspirin, which are pretty large doses, more than what we would uh, typically probably give. So I think the best study we can base this on is the PATCH trial. So this was a trial that came out in 2016 in Lancet, and it's a randomized trial from uh, 60 different sites of 190 patients and those were enrolled at, in the UK, France, and the Netherlands. They took patients with an ICH who had presented within six hours of symptom onset. They had to be on an antiplatelet for at least seven days prior to the uh, presentation. And those antiplatelet options were um, aspirin, clopidogrel, dipyramidol, um, or a combination of those medications. And they had to have a GCS of greater than eight. Patients were then randomized to either standard of care or standard of care plus a platelet transfusion. They got one unit of platelets if they were on aspirin and two units if they were on um, clopidogrel or dipyrimidol or any of the combination uh, dual antiplatelets. And they had to get that transfusion within 90 minutes of their imaging. And the primary outcome was their functional status as measured by modified Rankin at three months. And a secondary outcome was the rate of hematoma expansion in those patients. It was powered at 80% power to detect a 20% decrease in death or disability uh, due to platelet transfusion administration. So when we look at the primary outcome measure, the platelet transfusion patients are at the top, and this is their modified ranking. You actually see the proportion of patients that had poor outcomes, a modified ranking or five or six, those are the disabled or dead patients, <coughs> was actually higher in the platelet transfusion group by a significant amount. The odds ratio was um, over two for patients in the platelet transfusion group having more death and disability. 
and it was statistically significant. Looking at the secondary outcome, the primary uh, one of ICH growth, there really was no difference. We know that uh, controlling the growth of the, prevent, preventing ICH expansion is an important goal and definitely in, uh, affects outcomes. We can do that with blood pressure management. Blood pressure control is definitely proven, but does giving platelets change that? It does not. They're, the odds ratio and the p-values are not significant at all. So the patients that got the platelets didn't have any less expansion either. So how do we interpret this? I think we have to always take it with a grain of salt when we apply this to the patients that we're treating. I think first is to consider the number of pa what, what antiplatelet medications the patients were taking. And so most of them were just on aspirin alone, about 70 to 80% of them. And I think we all know from our experience, those are not always the patients that get into the most trouble. So it's those ones on the heftier medicines or dual antiplatelets that really keep us up at night. So this trial is based on mostly patients on aspirin, which are maybe not our primary concern, but for sure if it's just an aspirin, platelets don't seem to make a difference. Additionally, the exclusion criteria are important to consider. So this was not, a, no patients that had epidurals or subdurals, not trauma patients, no aneurysms, no ADMs, uh, no significant IDH. Uh, they also could not have, be on anticoagulants as well and they couldn't be planned for the OR within 24 hours. So these are non-surgical patients. So uh, these are all patients that were stable enough and deemed not to need surgery, at least initially. So probably not uh, the patients we're most concerned about, but patients we still encounter. And I think the final point is when you look at that bottom graph, the hematoma volume, um, over a third of the patients had small hemorrhages, less than seven cc's, uh, which are pretty small. So. Um, I think our, you know, we are always concerned even in small hemorrhages in patients that come in on antiplatelets, but the, you know, a large portion of this cohort were smaller bleeds. Two-thirds of them were under 30 cc's. So for a lot of us, I know 30 cc's is a threshold. We start to consider operating more, and that makes sense because operations were not included in this cohort. Um, so I think this is the best quality study we have to go on. Uh, we just have to make sure we interpret it correctly, but it, it definitely suggests that platelet transfusions are not helpful in preventing expansion or uh, in ch changing the functional outcome, and if anything, they were uh, detrimental to the patients. So what do the guidelines say? The traumatic brain injury guidelines don't actually make any mention about uh, antiplatelets or reversal of or platelet transfusions. What we do have to go on slightly is the AHA ASA guidelines for intracerebral hemorrhage management. And those come, came out in 2015 most recently. So prior to the PATCH trial coming out that we just discussed, so they don't have that to take into consideration, but they do say that the usefulness of platelet transfusions and ICH with a history of antiplatelet use is uncertain. And that was based on uh, those smaller studies of 30 or less patients that uh, looked at primarily laboratory outcomes that I had mentioned earlier. And going back to that NOVO7 or recombinant factor 7A, while it can limit the extent of hematoma expansion in any patient with an ICH, there's an increase in the thromboembolic risk and there's no clear benefit and it's not recommended. Um, so the only, you know, the, the standard management of how we manage all patients would apply, meaning good blood pressure management, supportive care, nutritional support, breathing tubes if they need them. And finally, I think the last thing to consider is what about patients that come in and need elective surgeries that are on these medications? How should we manage it? So uh, depending on your comfort level, you can consider continuing aspirin, uh, depending on why the patient's on it and your personal comfort. Um, as that, as, you know, someone that does a lot of vascular, there's plenty of times patients are on aspirin, brain tumors, surgeons may not be comfortable with that. Um, it's really up to you on that. But any of those uh, aspirin or any of the ADB inhibitors should be held for seven to 10 days because they're gonna poison the platelets for the duration of their lifespan. If you think about ticagrelor, um, because it's a, a, a reversible inhibitor, it should be out of the system based on its half-life in about 48 hours. Most guidelines don't separate it out, but you could theoretically do that. I know sometimes when we use it uh, in vascular patients off-label, we'll, We'll go with that medication over Plavix or Clopidogrel 
if someone has a drain, we're going to need to manage because with that medication, we know we can hold it, have a small window where they won't be exposed to the antiplatelets, get our procedure done and get them back on. Whereas if they're on one of the other agents, they're going to be uh, inhibited for the duration of over a week. And I think the last thing is there's a cost when we stop these medications and we are uh, always concerned about the, our side of things and neurosurgery always gets the benefit of the doubt of stopping those, but there is a cost to it. So um, for patients that are on aspirin for secondary prevention, the cardiovascular complications, they have an odds risk of 3.1 uh, in the eight to 10 days after they're off their aspirin. Uh, and that's for coronary issues and it peaks at about 14 days for cerebrovascular. Um, so as a person who has stroke procedures too, I can tell you we definitely see that happen. It doesn't mean we shouldn't stop those medications, but I think uh, we also need to give some thought to why, uh, why the patient's on the, that medication as well. Uh, some references, as well as on that last slide, there's a great reference at the bottom about those risks and benefits of stopping the medication that I think is a good reference. Um, feel free to email with any questions and I'm gonna pass it off to Dr. Sai. Thank you.